So that, that's a funny story, actually. Uh, I used to be a computer programmer a long, long, long time ago. I'm not sure if there's anybody from Eindhoven that remembers me. It was a very long time ago, but at some point I worked at Philips at the IP department, and my boss comes in in a meeting and he says, does anybody know what Linux is? And I said, it's, it's pronounced Linux, and then I was the open source expert. <laughs> Well, okay, with that, I will just disappear and we'll give the <laughs> stage to you. All right. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so we're supposed to have fun, and they thought, you know, let's have a lawyer do the keynote. So <laughs> that, that's what happens. Um, seems I'm the only suit over here as well, which is funny. Um, does anybody here identify as a hacker? And, all right. I'm sorry? <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's good, that's good. We're not going to tell a lawyer if we feel like a hacker, but that's a shame because hacking is supposed to be fun and it's supposed to do good. Or just fun. Or, sorry? Attitude. attitude, yes, hacking is an attitude. That's very correct. One thing we have noticed from the law perspective is that hacking very often goes against the law in some way. Part of it is because rules are boring. Rules, especially the law, are meant to maintain the social order. The law is by nature conservative, protective of the status quo. So if you do something new, if you do something unusual or dangerous, like having this, this carpet here, then you almost automatically fall afoul of the law. Technology has greatly accelerated this process. Hacking as such is older than technology, or at least technology as we commonly understand it. Putting a goat on top of the university tower is a hack. But it does not involve much technology, maybe a stick. Today, most of the hacking is associated with computers. Now, that has a long history. I will be talking about that a little bit. But what we have seen at some point is that people started what I call hacking the law. So when you talk to technologists, at some point they always get the question, can I do this? Is this legal? And then as a lawyer, you, you give them the legal rule. And when lawyers tell people the law, they just expect, okay, I, I will give you an idea, and people say, ah, okay, I will do that. But technologists, they will not just take the law, they will take it apart. Hey, that's funny. What happens if I do this? Is this also valid when you have such, or if you do it in... I don't know, PHP, or if I do that on Linux? Can I do it the opposite way? Hey, that's strange. You know that you, you have two contradictory laws when you have this particular use case? And they will say, yes, we know, please shut up, don't talk about that. Because we, you know, you guys may have legacy code. I don't know how, how old Drupal is and what's the oldest code still in there. But we have code that goes back to the Codex of Hammurabi, which is like 2000 BC. And we still have to actively support that because there are people relying on it. <laughs> so, and you know what the worst mistake is? I, I, I've learned a long time ago in software engineering, which is called version 2.0 syndrome. Does anybody know what that is? Let's do a clean rewrite. You know, version 1.0, it's full of crud. Some people call it version 3.0. I think that was the mistake that Netscape made in the 1990s. Let's do a complete rewrite from the ground up because our code is ugly. Yeah, well, it's ugly because it has to support everything. All that cruft is there for a reason. So if you start doing everything over again, you're just going to make all the old mistakes and somebody else is going to come along. But for some reason, from time to time, there's technologists that say, you know what? Let's do the law again. So this is for lawyers at least, a funny story, which is the crypto ship Satoshi. So some crypto bros, I'm not going to call them hackers, had the idea, you know what, let's reinvent society, but then using the blockchain. Not sure if Rian van Rijbroek is here, but they really thought, let's do it with Bitcoin and blockchain. So what they were going to do is this was Corona, COVID uh, uh, period, so lots of cruise ships were just sitting there. So they figured, you know what, we have lots of money, lots of Bitcoin at least, let's buy cruise ships, make them crypto cruise ships, and then go start our own society on the high seas. The ships can sit together, 
and they can vote on everything on the blockchain. You can pay with Bitcoin for everything. And then, you know, society will just magically reinvent the rules that are necessary and discard it. This is society 3.0. Now, it didn't work, of course. For one thing, when you put lots of people together, they are going to argue. They argue, for example, if you can bring pets in your rooms. They argue about the food. And then it turns out you need to have personnel. And they have union rules. And they will simply not come ashore, uh, uh, come on board and work for you if you do not abide by the union rules. You cannot stay on the high seas all the time because the ship will rust in front of you or below you, actually. So you're going to run into all kinds of problems where the lawyer said, yeah, we reinvent, we, we had that. I think that was a 1798 case and we solved that. I'm sorry, warts and all. Isn't the first time. I think the most famous situation where this happened was in 1994, I think, 1996, where John Perry Barlow de did the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, back when they called it cyberspace. He basically declared that the internet or the, the worldwide communication medium should no longer be subject to the law of the, the weary giants of flesh and steel. We do not need you anymore. We are building a social space that will be naturally independent. Sounds great. It was an excellent speech. Did it work? As in, did it have legal effect? No. He had a good run because there was precedent. Does anybody recognize this document? If you're Dutch, you should. So this is a plakkaat van Verlatingen, the act of secession, where we basically told the king of Spain, hey, we're going to do it on our own. This was the first time in history where a country used legal means to just declare itself independent. Before, hey, we, we of course had wars, we had secessions, people split up, the Roman Empire split up at some point, but they basically just did it. And they had of, often, most always, they had wars about it. Somebody speaking in my, in my microphone. Um, so we, the Dutch, basically just sent the king a letter. Hi, we're going to do it on our own. And that letter had legal effect. It was the inspiration for the Declaration of Independence of the United States and inspired a lot more organizations. Of course, we still had an 80-year war about it, so but that's an implementation detail. But just goes to show that words have power. Law has power. But also, technology has power. And now we get to hacking. We're talking about hacking. We shouldn't have to say, yeah, but not a criminal hacker or a cracker, as Richard Stallman asked us to use. A hacker is someone who explores the limits of what is possible in a spirit of playful cleverness. You try to push a machine beyond what is possible. You try to do stuff that it wasn't designed for. You try to make it do things that nobody thought possible and you try to be playful about it. Stephen Levy wrote the hacker ethic where he enumerated six principles for hackers. As you can see, none of them have anything to do with criminal activity. The association of hacking and criminality came from the 1980s. You should see this movie if you haven't already, War Games. Um, I got a lot of people at Tweakers upset when I called this a documentary. <laughs> I actually had people going to the, to, to the editor and saying, you know, there's a typo here because he calls it a documentary, but it's actually a movie. But my point was, lawmakers, governments, police, consider this a documentary. This is what hackers do. They sit behind a computer, they dial up their phones, and they may start World War III. Okay? It's actually a pretty, pretty realistic movie. Maybe not the girlfriend, but... <laughs> they <laughs> what they showed, in technology-wise, was really possible. I was considering putting in the little clip from uh, NCIS where they do the, the forehand typing because that's what Hollywood thinks these days is hacking. But hacking got a very bad image, well, basically ever since that movie, 
together with the Morris work, which happened around more or less the same time, where Robert Morris, just to see if he could, gewoon omdat het kan, he wrote a worm, a self-replicating piece of code. He intended that to stay in the local network, but he made a typo and it infected the whole internet. Which was back in the, in the 80s, not as much as it was today, but it crippled a lot of infrastructure, caused millions in damage to clean it up, and got him a federal conviction. So these two cases have, have done a lot to create an atmosphere of illegal hacking. We also had the Dutch hackers in 1991. That okay, somebody has their microphone on. Uh, Right. So, in 1991, we had a couple of Dutch hackers that broke into the Pentagon, which was something you did, and it was funny, and you left. But this guy stole the blueprints for the F-117 during the Gulf War. So that got a lot of people upset. So then we got a Dutch crime law, computer crime law, as a result, and we have been operating on that assumption ever since. So, hacking and the law have been a bit uneasy. Lawmakers have considered hackers to be strange people, dangerous people. And as a result, we have not seen much interaction between lawyers and technologists. Because the technology vision, if you do strange things, you know, the lawyers are going to get upset. Lawyers then think, well, I'm not seeing anything happening. So, nothing is happening. Because one thing you need to remember about lawyers, we are the modern age wizards. We write down how it shall be, and then it is. Okay? If we write it in the law, then the problem has been solved. We would be great specification writers. But we specify society, and then society will abide to our will. That's basically how lawyers work. And this works to a certain extent, because most of the time people are well willing. Well, if there's a new law, okay, you have to put your prices inclusive of your tea. Okay, we will do that. We have a few bad apples. They get sued or they get prosecuted, and the problem goes away. Technology, this is a lot harder. Um, there is a very underrated essay by Mark Scala, a computer scientist, that you should really read if you want to understand the complex nature between computer science, technology, and law. I don't know if anybody still plays Paranoia. It's a long time ago, anybody? No? Okay. Well, Wikipedia, it, it's, it's a great game, and it has to do with everybody being paranoid against everybody else. And what's happening in that game is an interaction between law and society. And one thing I have taken away from this essay in particular is the phenomenon of colored bits. So for computer scientists, you have bits, ones and zeros, and lawyers will take that as representations of information, which is correct, and then they will assign more meaning, what Scala calls color, to it. So lawyers will say, you will have to block the green bits. Green bits are illegal. Blue bits should get priority. I already see some Question marks here, bits are not blue. Blue is not a thing that you assign to a bit. That's metadata, true. And then we get into to XML, and I, don't, I really don't want to go there. But lawyers have no problem saying you cannot have green bits. We write specifications, and then the world will do our bidding. So if we say green bits are illegal, then they are illegal. If we say that, green, that blue bits should have priority, then they shall have priority, and you will make it work. It's just an implementation detail. We will get to that in a moment. But the concept that you have technology on the one hand and a fundamental incompatibility in views is a very difficult subject. In the 1990s, we got so much of this interaction between law and technology that we saw a new legal field, which is called cyber law, or according to some people, computer law, or what have you actually have a little diagram for that. Look, that's the Codex of Hammurabi. That's our oldest code. Um, and I put together a little diagram. It always confuses the lawyers where you have different types of law. You have technology law, which is the whole field, but I forgot to put the word. Then you have IT, information technology, 
Within there, you have ICT, which is only used in the Netherlands. You have internet law, you have cyber law, you have information law, and they all represent different things. If you want to know more about cyber law, my blog is somewhere in the middle, and you can Google it. Uh, and I try to write something about technology law every day. I'm going to skip this one, given the time. Um, the example I was going to discuss from Mr. Scala's essay about colored bits, I think one very good example is, is formed by the crypto wars. So this is the regulation of cryptography, which I'm sure you have encountered at some point in your career. The basic idea is that politicians think that information or encryption is something that you can make rules about. For example, the police should have a back door. Or if the police commands it, you will open up the end-to-end -end encryption and you will give us the confidence. But only if the good guys ask. Eh? Only the blue bits should get access to the information. And the green bits, the bad guys, if they ask for the information for the back door, you should not give it to them. This is an illustration of that, that fundamental principle, that fundamental difference in view between lawyers and technologists. I first encountered this in uh, 1993, when I was just starting information science, computer science, when people started talking about something called PGP, or pretty good privacy, which was the first time an encryption package appeared on the mass market. Today we would have called it open source, but that term didn't exist back then. And Mr. Phil Zimmerman just released it for the good of the world, complete source code package where you could do digital signatures and encryption. And the encryption keys were so strong that you couldn't break it with then state-of-the-art technology. Maybe the NSA could, the National Security Agency, but they wouldn't tell. So that was a big problem and a lot of three-letter agencies were very upset about that. So they tried to regulate it. They actually had laws about strong encryption. Those laws said they are munitions. They are arms, weapons. You cannot export weapons from the United States to other countries without a license. So they tried to prosecute Phil Zimmerman for violating that law, for exporting munitions by putting the PGP source code on a BBS. In response to that, we got lots of action from technologists, for example, that put together this T-shirt where they put, let's see if this works, no, where they put the complete source code of RSA, which is the digital signature and public key encryption technology behind it, in a Perl script. I don't know if anybody still programs Perl. I used to do it, but I went back to my old programs and couldn't read them anymore, but apparently that's a feature. But they put it together in four lines of Perl and printed that on a T-shirt in an OCR font. So you would take the T-shirt, send it to somebody else, and they could scan it. And they even put a barcode on it that gives you the same output. So this T-shirt is a munition, according to the law. We also had some very clever people at MIT and at Dutch universities that printed all the source code in a book, you know, a, a piece of paper uh, with a wrapping around it. And then they sold that book from the MIT bookstore, which was genius because then the FBI would have to say, hey, university, you cannot sell books with knowledge. And then there's something called the First Amendment and, and things like that. So that was a great hack, actually. This hack also worked. Nobody ever tried to stop the sale of those T-shirts. But it is somewhat more complicated because under the law, things can be multiple things at the same time. Yes, it's a T-shirt. It's also a munition. No, that's not the same thing. So law and technology have always been at a somewhat complicated balance. I mentioned open source just now. Open source is a term that came in the late 1990s when Netscape made that fatal mistake of rewriting version 3.0, got its market share eaten by Internet Explorer, and then said, you know what, let's give away the source code and call it quits. There was this guy, Richard Stallman, who had written the GPL, General Public License, back in 1991 because he believed all software should be free. And his free software foundation, his free software movement was gaining traction, but something more was needed. A lot of businesses were a bit hesitant about Stallman and his colleagues because they felt free software movement was too political, too confrontational. So 
some open source, uh, some free software hackers got together, picked a better term which they called open source. And that has been the business success ever since. In fact, it went quickly to such heights that Microsoft, the absolute king of the software world, declared it a threat. These are the leaked Halloween memorandums from the early 2000s, where Microsoft analysts tried to, to kill the danger of Linux in particular. Linux, the operating system, but also the open source movement in general, because what open source was doing was basically hacking. And it was the opposite of what Microsoft was doing, which was selling software licenses. And Microsoft really tried to kill off open source by using what was called fear, uncertainty, and doubt, FUD, and semi-legal strategies like telling all the lawyers, you know, this is dangerous, and the GPL is a viral license. I came across that myself in 2004. I figured, how can a license be a virus? But every lawyer you come across has heard about it that way. So that was a great way of front-running the discussion. I worked at the IP department. I, I have to perhaps apologize for that because I did a lot of software patents back in the days. And patents these days were one of the tools that Microsoft in particular tried to kill open source with. Because one of the things that open source did was commoditizing software, commoditizing APIs, and commoditizing standards. The World Wide Web, W3C that you see over there, was founded on the idea of open standards by Tim Berners-Lee. Making the technology available for everybody, just writing a specification saying, here, here's how it works, go have fun with it. The web was a hacking event, not a formal design system like America Online or CompuServe or what have you. It was hacked. It was a hack. And this has given rise to the idea of open standards, where you just basically say, okay, you want to connect to my service, here is how you do it. Go have fun. And then you have the patent lawyers, which are a special breed even among lawyers. They basically said, well, we have a patent on that, so you cannot do that. Patents used to be for mechanical engineering and electrical engineering, so how can they apply to software? Everybody rightfully asked. Even I did, and I was a patent lawyer. So, but the push from lawyers, lawmakers, that you have laws as a natural order, and hacking is somewhat illegal, made their perception in the discussion quite difficult. Because well, if you have patents, and they have been here for a hundred years, why should these hacker upstart, you know, the somewhat crazy people, suddenly have the right to ignore patents and do whatever they want? We saw this discussion in particular in Europe around 2004, when the European Union tried to uh, legalize software patents. They called them Computer Implemented Inventions, CII. Lawyers are very good with words. If you want to win a debate with lawyers, focus on your words, because then you have, you have a chance. But what I found during that debate is while the CII initiative was very well organized, they put a big boat behind the European Parliament saying vote, vote for the directive, hackers are very quick to think. The guys below there managed to get that, I think it's called a canoe, out there the same day. They had no idea this was happening, but they saw the boat, they said, okay, let's get a canoe, let's put a sign together, and just go out there and, and call it software patent skill innovation. That's a great example of how hackers work. Fro from that moment on, I concluded, okay, open source has won. If a movement is capable of withstanding these forces, and is capable of, of going out there, pushing software and making things available, then you have won. And as a corollary, Open standards have won, and that also has to do with what's called the Samba project, not this band, but the SMB, the, the, the short messaging block, I think it's called, from Windows, where the Samba project was an open source re-implementation of SMB, managed to get the European Union to investigate Microsoft and to get a declaration with the highest fine ever, saying, Microsoft, you have to open that standard. So we have open source, that one. We have open standards accepted legally, especially for big tech. Didn't call it back then. But still, we now see a society 
where big tech is too big to regulate, has taken over everything, has killed democracy, fake news. So what happened? Well, these are the platforms. The rise of the platforms. Every year you have to update your, your stock photo, but uh, you know, I don't care anymore. <laughs> so you have Facebook, which is now called Meta for some reason. Um, you also have the smaller platforms, or the more informal platforms like Reddit, where people share together and they centralize things again. So that means something of the hacker spirit has gone. Because these big companies lock up knowledge, lock up discussions and control everything. This was a fatal mistake in the early 1990s when the Clinton government started to free the internet. Al Gore invented the internet, obviously, but when they, but what he actually did was sponsor the National Information Superhighway Bill that made billions of dollars available for an upgrade to the internet in connection with the liberalization of the rules saying the internet is for everybody, not just for acad uh, academics. So from that moment on, companies have run the internet. And the policy decision from the Clinton government was the private sector should lead. This was the 1990s. Everybody believed, you know, capitalism has won. So let's run with it. We will make some rules, but those rules are basically, you know, to keep everything clean and we open up and up and we will see what people come up with. What did they come up with? World Online. Okay. So what they also came up with was a little guy called Jeff Bezos that made a bookstore. And Bezos was a very clever guy, still is actually, because at one point he decided everything is going to be an API. Or I guess we would call it a microservice these days, but he basically told his company, everybody will expose all their functionality through a microservice, a service interface. Anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. Thank you, have a nice day. So they did, then we got the cloud, and the rest, as they say, is history. This happened so quickly that the law had no idea. And in the span of about 10, 15 years, which for lawmakers is basically one session, we got things like replacing property with services. I bought a TV, smart TV with YouTube a couple years ago. So I could put my children in front of the TV and have them watch YouTube things. And then one morning, my daughter says, Daddy, YouTube is doing strange. And then it turns out they removed the app because the new app was not supported by the hardware. So what happens? Is that a violation of the law? Well, I figured this was my specialty, so I could have an answer, but it turns out this is not regulated. You can do that. You can remove that kind of stuff. Imagine people coming into your home and taking away your TV saying, no, it's no longer supported. But if you call it a service instead of a product, then suddenly you can. If you can do it through software, then you can. We have no rules for that. And all these companies and all these, these, these big tech organizations start doing stuff like this. Putting digital data out there, declaring it was not your property, but merely data declaring that you could not access that data except to their API, which could change from time to time at company's discretion. And they got away with it because they were too big to regulate. This was particularly true in the United States where these companies had so much venture capital at their disposal that they were able to just make up their own rules or ignore the rules that were there, move fast and break things, the things in that sentence, it was the Facebook motto, is the law. Move fast and break the law. Because by the time the lawyers, A, understand what you did, B, B, come up with an adequate response, and C, get that argued by the court, you will have won. And this is the challenge we are facing today. Companies that have so much money and so much power that regulating them is virtually impossible. Because at this stage, for example, telling Twitter to stop disinformation, the only way to do it is basically tell fi uh, Twitter, go away from Europe. You cannot find them any meaningful amount because there is so much money, or maybe not Twitter because they're not even paying their rent, but they, 
you know, if you find Facebook a couple billion of euros, which is huge for normal people, they will just pay it. And you will not get the result that you want, which is a change in their behavior. So, so you have to step in and then tell these people, oh, I'm so sorry about this. This is the Facebook lawyer, I guess. Um, so, where was I? So, when you have these companies, you can step in and you can say, okay, you're going to do things differently from now on. But then they can bamboozle you with lots of techno technological wording. So, what you, what you were seeing now, from Europe in particular, is a lot of new laws. And it has taken some time, but they're all coming off the... Off the uh, the conveyor belt at the same time. We had the GDPR regulating uh, personal data. We have uh, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act trying to set new rules. Lawyers trying to hack the tech. Trying to set new rules, including compliance. For example, in the Digital Markets Act, it says you're a big company, you have to pay us, you have to pay the government so we can hire the people that can regulate you, which I like as a very clever hack. So we're trying. And some have predicted the death of big tech from here. It also has to do with the metaverse because nobody has ever understood the metaverse. I was in Second Life a long time ago. That was something fun, but I'm not sure if it actually did anything. But the metaverse, is, is anybody on the metaverse? Is that, can you say that? I'm on the metaverse, I'm in the metaverse. I laugh at the metaverse, surely you can say that. But anyway, so maybe big tech is going away. But as a result of all these laws, there are also new threats or new challenges, as my coach uh, wants me to say. One challenge that you may have heard about that also threatens open source is called the Cyber Resilience Act. This may actually also impact Drupal. The Cyber Resilience Act is the idea that the Internet of Things, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say shit up here, but the Internet of Things is full of crapware. So products that are put on the market should have good quality and they should be safe. They should be resilient. If you have resilient products, if you have cyber products, so they are somehow connected to the Internet, you must comply with these rules, which means high security, updates, and continuous information security uh, uh, update cycles and best practices. They want to apply this to every product that's put on the market. And here's the secret that most lawyers are still surprised at. Every IoT device out there is full of open source. Open source has one. If you want to make a product, you will use open source. I forgot to put in the XKCD, but you know the, the big stack with the little guy from Nebraska? Okay, so that's the thing. If that is the security library, I was going to say hard bleed, uh, then you have a big problem as a company because then you have to make your product resilient. But also if you are an open source community, because the definition of product is so broad that something like Drupal or LibreOffice, things like that, Apache, are also covered by it. We want everybody to be resilient. Also the open source guys. And I am not sure if that is merely, we made a big definition, oh sorry guys you caught, caught up, or if there is some intentional thinking like the open source guys are maybe a little dangerous, so let's put them in as well. Or maybe it's well intentioned, which is even worse. I'm sorry I did a bad thing, but I had the best intentions. Um, I'm not sure yet, but security is a big thing and you're going to be hit by it. Finally, a little talk about the AI Act. We are seeing a lot of machine learning on steroids these days. If you call it AI, you get a lot of more ven venture funding. So we're going to call it AI, but it's basically a chat interface to Excel. So I am not sure what actually, but I'm selling products as well. I, I, I admit it. I have robots that scan contracts, that read contracts. So I know what it's like. This is a new example of a gold rush, a hype, people coming in, break the law, huh? you know, just download everybody's stuff, download the whole internet, call it data mining and AI. 
and we may get away with it. This time, Europe at least was a little quicker with new laws that try to regulate AI, saying you need to have good processes in place, you need to ensure that there is no bias, you need to ensure that it's robust and that it's predictable, transparent and explainable. This is also going to apply to open source models. This is also going to apply to communities that want to stimulate machine learning and AI. Not because they don't trust open source, but the big tech guys, they spoiled it. The lawyers, the lawmakers only half understand it. And they are talking different things. They want to regulate Terminator 2, because that's another documentary that these people watch. They want to regulate the future of AI. Just, just this morning I saw a big advert again of people saying, you know, AI is going to kill the world and we must act quickly to prevent it. While in the meantime, chatbots struggle to find meaning in the most basic of sentences. Where generative AI is hailed as understanding, gaining consciousness, but it's just putting together patterns. So on that depressing note, I return to my earlier slide of colored bits. When you talk to lawyers, when you talk about the law, remember that your idea of how technology works, you have ones and zeros, it's not necessarily the same as the law people that you talk to. Bits can be green. I want you to filter out the blue bits. Okay? Only uncolored bits can pass. This is not because they don't understand what bits are, but they have different goals, different backgrounds, and they are looking for different things. So be kind to your lawyer. Your lawyer will try to be kind to you, but keep in mind, open source has one, open standards have one, and we will also, again, prevail in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you so very much for, uh, for such an amazing uh, session. It was an absolute pleasure having you. Uh, I know that we were planning like Q&A session, but like sadly enough, we're like, uh, running s uh, slightly behind the schedule. So guys, I urge you to catch this man before he goes and, like, and ask his, uh, uh, the questions that you have. And I know as well that you are, uh, you recently you had a new book published, yes. didn't mm -hmm. you? Yes, we've got a new book out there. It's yeah. in Dutch, but... Uh, ICT and Recht, Google it and you will find it. Uh, if you want a signed copy, come to me and we will talk about it later. Okay, perfect. perfect. And just, just a moment before you go. Yes. So we have a little something for you. Thank you once again for joining us today. Okay, and great. Yeah. Enjoy the flowers. Let Thank them blossom a little bit. <laughs> Thank you so very much. All right.